Well, good morning and welcome to Grace Church Australia. My name is Pastor Wayne Hines and so good to have you with us. And what a fantastic way. I love that song, The Goodness of God. And I love, there's a line there towards the end, your goodness is running after me. And I very much hope and pray that that has been the week where God's goodness has just been running after you and has been with you. Now, we had a bunch of goodness last week when it comes to Grace Church because we had church in the park. And a big thank you to everybody that was there, we did actually get to share some fantastic testimonies of the goodness of God and uh, great weather, great fellowship and a fantastic time was had. Now today, Pastor Steve Blake is with us. He's going to be continuing his series on singing in the storm. And I want to let you know, next Sunday we gather in person once again. That's October 18. It's at the Boathouse, which is one of the meeting rooms at Crew Lake Mac, formerly known as Crusaders. It's on Yarrawonga Park road down there at Bell Colin, a beautiful venue and uh, we're going to have a whole bunch of fun. Service starts at 10 o'clock, okay, 9.30 for our online gathering, but in person it starts at 10 o'clock. If uh, you have any questions or anything like that, feel free to just uh, note them down in the chat function this morning and we'll do our very best to answer that for you. But very excited to be meeting October 18 and once again November 15, currently working on a venue for our Christmas service as well. Now that means our next kids service will actually not be next Sunday, but the Sunday after at gracechurchkids.online.church. That is going to be October 25 kids returning from school holidays. Hey, a big congratulations to Jane Bucken, one of our awesome elders and leadership team here at Grace Church, because she was nominated for the New South Wales Volunteer Year of the uh, Volunteer of the Year Award. There it is. That's the certificate that Jane received. And the exciting thing for me, and hopefully for you, is she was nominated for our very own Grace Church Walking Group. And that really is going beyond the walls. So congratulations, Jane, and congratulations to everybody who is going beyond the walls to represent not only Grace Church, but to represent Jesus in every sphere and every walk of life, pun completely intended. Now, just a reminder about our giving. I want to thank you once again for your faithfulness when it comes to sowing in financially to the kingdom of God. And thank you for those that have been able to uh, transition from putting money in the bags uh, to giving electronic. We know it's not necessarily the default setting or the natural thing for a lot of people, but we are so very thankful for your continued generosity. As I said, Pastor Steve is continuing uh, his message series today, Singing in the Storm. And if you didn't uh, get to hear the last message or the first message in this series just a couple of weeks ago, it is available for you to catch up on via our gracegathering.online website and also some devotionals there, curated worship and a whole bunch more. Now we're going to get into a time of worship as we prepare to hear this word in season. But as we do that, I want to share with you a verse from 1 Corinthians 16. It verse, it's verses 13 and 14. And it says this, remember to stay alert and hold firmly to all that you believe. Be mighty and full of courage. Let love and kindness be the motivation behind all that you do. I pray that is a word of encouragement for you as we head into this time of worship. You see what's hidden under the surface You see the beauty under the top
Thank you, Jesus, that we are part of your family and you are part of our family individually and our church family at Grace Church. And uh, church, I really hope that that uh, worship just ministered to you this morning. I've had something stirring in my spirit for it feels like the last few months and I felt it again this morning and I hope you did as well. Now, Pastor Steve Blake is going to share this morning's word. It's the second part of his series, Singing in the Storm. And I know for many people at Grace Church, it has felt like the storm has been raging for months and months, but there is very much a key to getting to the other side. And part of that, as Pastor Steve is going to share, is singing in the storm. Now, before I hand over to Pastor Steve, can I just ask you to be praying for Steve and Helen and their whole team at Liberty People. They do a fantastic work across the nations when it comes to their ministry. But as you can imagine, with our international borders closed, they haven't been able to travel very much this year. And I was talking to Steve just a couple of weeks ago, and he was saying it's the longest time that he's been in Australia for many, many years. But as a ministry, like many churches and many other ministries, they've learned to connect with people via electronic means, and they've been very thankful for that. But be praying for them and make sure at the end of today's message, I've got a way that you can actually be sowing into the work of Liberty People. They're sending a container off to one of the nations they work in. So I'll give you some details on that after we hear from Pastor Steve Blake. Hi, it's great to be back at long last for part two of our study, Sing in the Storm. You might remember what we read and how we went with this in our last study. It was just a terrific thing for us to do and 
look into and pray into, but we began there in this passage in Philippians chapter 4, well-known, glorious verses. He says from verse 6 and 7, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, in everything, with prayer and supplication, that is your earnest requests before God. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through our Lord Jesus Christ. Magnificent advice from the scripture. He went on to then talk about whatever things are pure and lovely and good and godly. Think upon these things. Meditate on these things. And then this wonderful advice where he said, the things that you learned and received and heard and saw in me, do these things and the God of peace will be with you. And Paul had modelled here to this church. Remember we talked about him being on this absolute roller coaster of emotion, coming into Philippi, the call of the uh, gospel, to take the gospel across. Come over here to us, said the Macedonian man. And somehow led by the Spirit of God, the Apostle Paul ended up here at Philippi. And he had that baptism of Lydia, the seller of purple, the very first convert in the whole European world. And that was the commencement of the gospel into the European world, which, in a way, that's the shoulders that us in any Western civilization are standing on. We're standing on the shoulders of this sacrifice of Paul. And then in that whole drama unfolding of Paul being at Philippi, you might remember he was tossed into the prison, him with Silas. And at the midnight hour, in the darkest hour of the darkest situation, when they knew they were in the will of God, what were they doing? They were singing praise unto the Lord. And all of the prison house was listening to him. And you know the deliverance that happened. So when Paul said, whatever things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, do these things and the God of peace will be with you. So he modelled that and we talked about that in the last study. Today we're just going to talk a little more into the thing of the storms in life and the storms that come and how to sing and rejoice in the middle of them. First, I see in the scripture there are storms, this is number one, storms where we seek shelter. Now this is not weak, this is not a weak place. This is actually a powerful place. When you learn to find your shelter In the presence of God. In Psalm 57 and verse 1, uh, here we see David. In fact, it was David fleeing from the jealous, murderous Saul who had lost the anointing as king and running into a cave and writing these precious words In the shadow of your wings I will make my refuge until these calamities are passed over me. So you can see. Here, David just running into this shelter. He, he drew this glorious picture of beneath the uh, covering of the wings of God. I will make my refuge in the shadow of your wings. Now, this is one of the most powerful things you can do because there are storms in life where the absolute best thing you can do is seek the refuge of the presence of God. I noted that it says in the little foreword to this particular psalm, it says that in the cave when he fled from Saul. In the cave, there was a song that came out from David. It went something like this. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Rejoice in God. And then he says, For you have made my feet like hind's feet, and you have set me upon my high places. A king in a cave. What does a king do in a cave? He sings. You know, there is a place of refuge in God, which is a place that some storms, the best response, the most powerful response, is to seek a new dimension of refuge in the presence of God that you've never had before. And I do believe that with every storm, God can have a purpose. God can have something that comes through, something that starts as the new song of your life. Through a time of storm, yes, not only your victories, your victories are great. But I notice the people in the scripture who get a lot of attention 
as those who are the mighty people of God are the overcomers. The people who learn to come through in an overcoming sense. Where we have taken that which was something against us and we've turned it into something beautiful. Where our heart has learned to go after the shelter of the presence of God. Beneath the shadow of your wings, I will. What? How did he say it? I will make my refuge until these calamities are passed over me. There are times in life when it feels like the storm isn't going to end, but there always seems to be in Scripture a promise. Remember in another message we spoke about Job, and he, and he was speaking about how uh, when his testing was over, when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. You know, it's a beautiful thing to understand that the storms of life will come. They have a beginning and an end. And God seems to set the boundaries of that sometimes. And sometimes I get the feeling that it'll finish when God says it'll finish. It'll finish when God has done what he wants to do. I find the shelter response a very powerful thing. When I'm passing through things, sometimes throwing my life into the shelter of the wings of God, learning to hide. Sometimes you're not hiding because you're a defeated person. You're hiding in a very powerful secret place where God is there and he is supplying, speaking, teaching, encouraging, promising, encouraging your heart and you start to see, hey God, you've set my feet on high places. You've given me feet to go higher. I remember going around the northern coasts of the island of Tanna in Vanuatu where we have quite a bit of a big ministry that was going there and uh, we'd watch the little mountain goats on the cliffs, even the little tiny ones that might, might have been only a few weeks old and they're up these cliffs just boom, boom, boom. Their feet are designed for those higher places. And so it was that David spoke of that. Now, not all storms are storms to seek shelter alone. There are storms that we actually should rebuke. This is the second kind of storm that comes. And this also has a very powerful and positive and good and godly thing within it. Normally the storms that you rebuke are storms that have a lot of destructive intent. For example, like evil intent. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus said to them from verse 35, let's go over to the other side of the sea. They got in the boat and it says, and it suddenly a mighty storm in the, in the middle of the night, a mighty storm came against them. And they were beginning to take on water in the boat and the disciples were incredibly distressed at their situation. It was hopeless. They thought that they were dying. They literally did. And here's Jesus asleep in the back of the boat. And they wake him up. Lord, don't you care that we are dying? <laughs> I think Jesus had a lot, has a lot of care about the fact that people are dying. I think he has a lot of intent and knowledge in that things that are so destructive can be happening that could be life-threatening like this. But he stood and, and the Bible says that he rebuked the wind and the waves and instantly they were just settled and it was perfectly calm instantly at the word of Jesus. Rebuke is a powerful thing when you think about it because it means that you have caught hold of the destructive intent of the enemy in this storm. This is a storm which is primarily an enemy's storm where he has an intent to do damage. And you know that God has given you the authority. Jesus actually said to the disciples, oh, you, you guys, your faith is so small. And you think, well, probably I'd have been a bit the same, to be honest. I don't like wild seas. I've been in them. I've been in dangerous part, uh, times in the sea, to be honest. And I don't like it. I don't naturally enjoy it. But there's times when you're in very dangerous, very harsh times that seem to be that it's like all the power of hell is coming against you. I believe that's the time to stand and rebuke. Now, some people get into rebuking Satan over and over and over. And I've seen in some parts of the world where I go, such an amount of... They, they seem to speak more to the devil than they do speak to God sometimes. It's like 
this is our warfare. We speak at the devil and we shout at the devil and we do this at the devil. I, d I just don't see that Jesus got up in that boat and he went through this whole rehearsal of a thousand things to, to rebuke. He rebuked what was going on. And he spoke to the wind and the waves. And they were immediately calmed and stilled. And that's beautiful. Let's not go chasing the devil, but let's understand that there are times when we can rebuke that storm that's going on in the name of Jesus, because we know that the author of that storm is the power of darkness itself. And when you're clear about that, don't you hold back for, mo for one moment. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Stand against any destructive plan of Satan and he will flee from you. Amen. Now, the third type of storm is one that uh, I think a lot of us will really understand. And that's the storm where we have to stand and endure. And the very purpose sometimes is to endure through the storm. You know that you've got the access to the presence of God and your prayer life and all of that. But you feel like this thing's just going on. This thing just keeps on going. And there's an enduring thing where I have to stand and endure throughout this storm. A classic example of that in the Bible was God's intention to send Paul to Rome at the end of his life. It was all in the will of God and it seemed such a loss. It seemed like such an unusual thing that God's been telling Paul, you're going to go to Rome and you're going to suffer at Rome, but the testimony of the gospel belongs at Rome. And you'll go there in chains and you'll be bound there and you're never going to leave there. That's going to be the end of your life there. And so in the timing of the travel, which was by sea across the Mediterranean, when they crossed very quickly from Cyprus on, they were just in the middle of constant headwinds until that became Cyclodian. It became the great powerful Nor'wester or whatever that name means. I think that's what it means. And do you know, for 14 days and nights, they could barely see the difference between night and day. They were just so tossed by this storm that the boat itself was beginning to break to pieces. Now, in the middle of a storm like that, you could excuse Paul for doing the things like he knew all the stories about Jesus in the storm and rebuking the storm. Maybe he tried that. I don't know. It doesn't say that he did or he didn't. But what I do know is that he was in the presence of God in the midst of that storm through this endurance, which was unbelievably hard times. There were actually 276 people on the boat and, and Paul was conscious of all of those souls not to be lost. And an angel of the Lord came down and visited him like, hey, Paul, we've heard your prayer <laughs> and you're going you're gonna to be in Rome, mate. You're going to get to Rome and no one on this ship is going to be lost but you're actually going to be shipwrecked on a certain island. Didn't even tell him which island it was, even though they knew. And so sometimes in the storms that you endure, you know that God's in it, but you're not real clear on the detail. You just know that God has promised me that he's here with me and I must endure this storm, which Paul did. And it happened exactly according to what the angel said. Now you would think to yourself, God wouldn't just send an angel to say, uh, you're going to make it through, you're going to get shipwrecked, but no one's going to get lost. Why couldn't God have just rebuked the storm on the spot? Why couldn't he have just dealt with the storm? But what he dealt with was the purpose of the storm. You're going to have to endure this because you're on a journey here and you've got an intended destination through this storm. You're going through this to something. Now, so it's very strong and very good to remind ourselves of this when we're in the middle of a storm. I'm going through. I'm going through. I remember an old song when I was a young pastor about 30-something. <laughs> That's 30 years ago. We're going through. We're going through. We're going through. Don't stop. We're going through. And it was a very strong, it had a sort of a American... Um, African-American kind of feel to it and it was just so powerful and we used to do it in our church in our Aussie style which sounded pretty crazy probably but there we were we're going through and when you endure a storm God gave him everything he needed to go through it but he didn't take it out of the way where they ended up shipwrecked was Malta and what happened at Malta was the gospel transformed the island 
You know how Paul arrived there, they're all beaten, they're freezing cold, lights a fire, and gets, goes to get some firewood, a viper attaches itself onto his hand. I often talk about snakes, don't I? I don't like the jolly things. Anyway, bitten by this viper and all the locals, all the Maltese people, they were watching and on the countdown, okay, right, oh, when this viper bites, <coughs> he's got 35 seconds. Nothing happened. He didn't die. Nothing happened to him. The poison had no impact on him. So they worshipped him as a god. And then Paul began to preach the power of the gospel to them. And the island was saved by the power of God through the testimony of Paul coming there. The testimony of the snake that couldn't kill him. The storm that couldn't kill him. The storm that didn't kill one person on that boat. The intention of God being perfectly fulfilled until Paul got to Rome. From Rome, not only was he there able to proclaim the gospel there where he was, but wrote some of the most phenomenal epistles that went out to the churches, the revelations of God that happened in Paul through those things. Storms to stand and endure. You may be in one of those. You may understand this. I'm encouraging you to sing and worship and rejoice even in the endurance. Come, come into that place. There's another type, of, a fourth one, which I call the storms with great purpose. James tells us in chapter 1, from verse 2 and 3, Count it all joy when you encounter various trials. And then he goes on to say how these trials produce patience and patience and virtue and faith through trials. And God allows these. It's God's intent that these trials will produce something. It's like how... It's how trees become strong, is that they have to withstand gale force winds. And trees have muscles in them. Trees have a sense. I did my original work, my original training was in a timber mill. And I would watch the huge logs going through the great big uh, cutting down saws and the, the stresses and the tensions within the tree, which had kept it straight and upright, kept it against the prevailing winds. And you'd, you would watch the... The, the log splitting this way and that, and the wise people using those great big saws could cut the timber so it remained perfectly straight and, and, and held that strength within the timber as they turned that into uh, the timber for buildings and things that we were doing. And it was such an art form, watching and cutting and shaping up those huge big planks of timber that would retain the strength and integrity and the power and the ability of that tree to withstand a lifetime of pressure. And that's exactly what happens. That's what builds strength into them is what they endure. But the last one is this, and the one I really feel <laughs> I heard from God about. And please forgive me if this gets a bit tough, but here we go. These are the storms of our own doing. Really? How can I create a storm? My word, you can. Sometimes we do. We end up in a storm and we've done it. We've been the ones who've done it. How, what do I mean by this? I notice, for example, in Hosea chapter 8 and verse 7, there's an interesting verse here where it says, They sow to the wind and they reap the whirlwind. It's talking about Israel and its disobedience. And it's lack of seeking God, in not even seeking the way of the Lord or wanting to walk in his paths or in his truth. They just went in their own way. And God began to rebuke them because not only had they become idolatrous and were turning so far away from him, but they were becoming the gods of their own directions. And they had sown a storm. He talked here about sow and reap. Sow to the, storm, to the wind, you reap the whirlwind. I don't know if you've been in a windstorm before. I remember some of the storms that we've seen, even here in the Hunter Valley in New South Wales, sometimes we get those massive sandstorms which are whipped up by storm force winds on, on the drought land and it picks up the sand and it just blasts through. And we've had it here, we've had dust and grit all over the house and all over the place and it, it's just immense. But these windstorms are so powerful. You know, they can uproot things, they drag things down, they tear things apart. It's like as though this kind of storm of our own doing is a little bit of a storm of chaos. 
Have you ever had one of them in your life, a storm of chaos? And sometimes when I look into this, I think of the different storms. There can be relational storms, there can be family storms, there can be health storms, there are financial storms, accidents, and a pandemic type of storm. So all these things are like storm cloud things that come coming in on you like this. But there's some that we have done. Sometimes we're reaping a whirlwind because we've sown to the wind. What do I mean sown to the wind, this chaos of reaping the whirlwind? Sometimes I think we sow to the world when we behave in such a way that's like saying, well, whatever will be, will be. I'll have a go at this. I reckon, I reckon this might work. And in no way are we consulting the wisdom of God. How many times... Do we have to pick up and help and assist people who go through the most horrendous storms, financial storms, business storms, family storms, because they've just lived in this thing that they didn't sow into the godly path. They sowed into the wind and just let it land where it would. Made a decision and said, well, see how it goes. Well, anyone can do that. You know, anybody can live like that. But if you want to reap a whirlwind, all you have to do is sow into the wind. Just throw your whole life and your directions and your decisions and your family and your business and the major considerations of your life, just put them out there to where the wind blows. And I tell you what, you're going to reap a whirlwind. This is tough, isn't it? It's a bit tough, but I'm promising you that this is true. In my life as a pastor, as a church planter, people that I've led to Christ, people that I've... Uh, discipled in Christ, people have been members of my church who've passed through the most horrendous things because God wasn't there in it with them. And they just sowed into the wind. You can't just say, well, when my kids get old enough, I'll let them decide how what they're going to believe. You know what you're doing? You're tossing your kids out into the wind. And you're saying wherever they land, that's where they'll land. And if you want to reap a whirlwind, start doing that kind of thing. If you want to reap a family which is godly and in the hands of God, then you sow your whole prayer life, your worship life, into what you know God has for you. Not what you think may happen or we'll see what happens. I'll just sow it into the wind. Whatever will be, will be. Oh, the number of businesses, the number of bad decisions, the number of people who've taken on business partners and ended up in chaos and they never sought God once and they're in a storm. And that actually requires quite a bit of repentance and it's hard to sing in that kind of storm because you feel like, if only I could turn back time <laughs> and you, you know you can't. There's no prayer or no decision making before God, no time spent seeking God, just sowing out there to the wind. So our text in Philippians said, in everything, with prayer, with earnest request, make, let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God will be there and it'll keep your heart and mind. And then he went on to say, you'll be able to think into good, virtuous, right, proper, beautiful things. Any virtue, any praise, any thanksgiving in it. And then he said, the God of peace is going to be with you. You just do what I did. You walk through these things, what you've seen, heard, what you've watched happening with me, what you've observed and what you've received from me, what you've seen in me, go and do these things. And what those Philippians had seen was an apostle who sang in the middle of no matter what storm. And what sort of storm was it when he was tossed in jail? Did he do it to himself? Not really. He just preached the gospel. He was obedient to Christ. But the storm still came. Did he feel like a victim? Not for a moment. Did he say it's not fair? Never. What things came out of his mouth? Songs of praise and worship to God in the middle of his storm. So I pray that these simple little studies will make sense to you. I don't want you to pass through a storm and it's all just been a destructive thing and messed up everything. I want you to be able to pass through a storm where the God of peace has been there with you. And God bless you all.
Well, Steve, thank you once again. Always a fantastic word in season. I hope that was an encouragement to you. Maybe challenged you just a little bit, but it really just pumped you up and lifted your spirits, particularly if you've been doing it tough over the last few weeks or the last few months. Now, I mentioned before Pastor Steve started speaking about a way that uh, we can be partnering with Liberty people. Well, they are actually looking for some items to put into a container to send to Vanuatu. That is one of the nations that they minister to. And you can see on your screen there the kind of things that they are actually looking for. So they're looking for canned foods, uh, they're looking for uh, clothing and everything else that is listed on the screen. Now, the only thing that I need to say, a couple of things. One is that if you'd love to donate something, I would encourage you to do so. Of course, be prayerful about how you might be able to do that. Um, but if you are going to do that, it has to be something that is brand new, okay? This container is gonna be filled with food items. They don't wanna have to get it fumigated and if it contains secondhand items, uh, they do need to go through that fumigation process. So it can only be brand new items and they will need to be available by the end of October. Now, in terms of where to drop them off and those kind of things, feel free to reach out to, uh, to Grace Church. You can email me, wayne at gracechurch.net.au. You can also contact uh, the church on our phone number, 0466472231, and we'll organize for uh, somebody to come and collect those for you a bit closer to the end of October. Thank you so much for your company at this online gathering of Grace Church Australia. It has been fantastic to be with you, but I am very excited about next Sunday because we gather once again in person, 10 o'clock at the Boathouse Meeting Room at Crew Lake Mac, Yarrawonga Park Road there in Balcol. And as I said, if you do need the details or you've got some questions about that, feel free to put them there in the chat function. Also in the chat function is the link for our Zoom catch up today. It's an opportunity for us just to spend a bit of time with each other, pray for each other, see how we're going, encourage each other and all those kind of things. So if you've never joined us for the Zoom catch up before, I encourage you just click on the link. You don't have to stay for the whole 30 or so minutes that we usually do it. Just pop in, say hello, wave to everybody, let us know that you're doing well and then you can go about the rest of your day. Enjoy your week. Enjoy everything that God has for you. Make sure that you keep an eye out for his goodness in amongst the uh, challenges of life. And we look forward to seeing you next Sunday for an, uh, not an online gathering, but an in-person gathering of Grace Church Australia. Yeah.